Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Johnson. I'm Chris Sloan. And we're your co-host tonight for Wild Bearings presentation on Stack Rock Creek in North Carolina. Uh, this is a series uh, of fly fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway that we started a couple of years ago. And I think this is probably number 20 or 21 that we've done, Chris. Yeah, I feel like we've, we've kind of covered the gamut, uh, at least on the North Carolina section. So we, we're glad you're all with us tonight. Um, we think this is a really good creek we're going to be talking about uh, today, and um, hopefully some of you, I know I know some of you have fished it, and uh, probably a few more of you will be, before it's over with. Um, a little bit about um, the, the the program as we get started, you know, if you, if you do like what you see, uh, if you would please, you know, on our YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you know, like, follow, subscribe. Our sponsor tonight is Mojo Sportswear Company. Chris, you want to talk about Mojo? Yeah, I mean, Mojo's a great company, a great product, antimicrobial, doesn't stink, uh, dries out really well, and uh, just high quality product. Uh, we, we, we're pretty hard on our stuff, and uh, Mojo is, uh, is definitely a, a great product line. Um, if, if you're going to be anywhere outdoors. So uh, check them out. you got a discount code WB10. Uh, if you go to our website, it'll direct you to the Mojo website and you can place your order. Hey, good. Great yeah. stuff. Hey, this all started because of this book. Um, I always start out uh, talking for about a minute about the book because everything you're going to hear tonight is already in this book for the most part in even more detail. But this book was launched at the very beginning of COVID. Uh, after about four years of writing, it's a first-in-class book forwarded by our buddy Mark Woods, who was the superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway at the time, who's a good buddy of ours, Bamboo Rod Fisher, and uh, just a, a generally good guy. Um, the thing that, that keep in mind that there, there are four 63-mile sections uh, that I group all the water into, and provide a lot of uh, history, lore, outfitters, you know, the you know where you can stay the food, if there's a brewery close by, a place to buy cigars, but generally a great, um, a great overview of the Blue Ridge Parkway and all the water that's along it. Um, something very near and dear to our heart and, and about five to 10% of any profit we make on anything goes to the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation. Um, but it, it, most of you are probably familiar with the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, but you know this is the longest national park in the world, 469 miles long, 252 in North Carolina and 217 in Virginia. The thing that's interesting to me about it is that there's over 13,000 feet of tunnels on this on this stretch of asphalt, 26 of those being in North Carolina which is kind of interesting to me. That tells you a lot about the topography. Um, but the, the biggest thing that's important about the parkway is how much water there is on both sides of it, especially on the south side. A lot of watersheds, a lot of great places to go fishing. Um, now, before we get started, a, a little bit about Chris and I, just so you know a little bit about who we are. Again, uh, I'm Sam Johnson, your co-host. Um, I'm also uh, one of the co-hosts and the executive executive producer for Wild Bearings Outdoors TV show on the Country Network. Um, we just finished our first se season, and we're starting our second season shooting in October of this year. And it'll start out at the uh, Biltmore State in uh in Asheville and we'll be fishing the secret waters of old George Vanderbilt there uh Chris you'll tell them a little bit about yourself yeah no I, I'm the other co-host of Wild Bearings Outdoors and of this uh webinar cast and uh we like to dial into the areas we don't um talk about a specific area to fish but we do like to cover the general topography in the area and and uh enjoy talking about bugs uh that's usually my role because uh, I get into the entomology and what I think uh, helps catch fish. So you're, you're kind of a buggy kind of I'm guy. I'm kind of a buggy anyway. kind of guy. So uh, I'll cover my section. will pop up here in a little bit. And we'll talk about, hey, what are some things that you can choose that, that may help you get on those uh, those wild fish? Excellent. Okay. Yep. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we break the Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina down to four 63-mile sections. The first one starting in Cherokee. And it runs uh, between Cullowee and, and Silva, Waynesville, and then up through a place called Buck Springs, 
which is south of uh, just on the on really the the south east uh, slope of Mount Pisgah and just under Asheville, North Carolina. And from from Buck Springs, it starts out heads up through Asheville, just under Mount Mitchell and up through Spruce Pine uh, by around Highway 80 is the is the second uh, section of the Blue Ridge Parkway that that we divide the water into and then from Spruce Pine or Highway 80 it picks up runs up through Linville uh, on the south side of Grandfather Mountain and then right almost through Blowing Rock and up to a place called E.B. Jeffrey State Park uh, where it picks up the the last and final leg in North Carolina and then runs up to the the, the, the state line uh, right under Galax, Virginia. A uh, huge amount of water uh, all along the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, if you're interested in, in, in exploring it more, uh, we certainly encourage you to do that. Get up and just drive it, looking under uh, bridges and culverts and look for those wide spots and get out there and chase those, chase those trout and you'll have a great time. Um, Chris, you'll talk about what, how we're gonna kind of divide this up tonight? Yeah, I mean, we'll go into some regulations, permits, licenses. Um, we'll, we'll focus kind of uh, 30,000 foot on the area of the map, some images. Uh, we're gonna talk about Stack Rock and Andrews uh, a little bit. Uh, we'll get into some bugs and some gear. What do we fish with, which we're bamboo guys, and typically that's what we have. Uh, and then we always like to point out uh, some of the local outfitters. Uh, th those are uh, important folks um, that uh, their livelihoods depend on the area, and uh, we always like to highlight them. Uh, and then we'll get into some Q&A at the end and uh, address any specific questions that you may have. Absolutely. And, and let's, I'd like to also make it clear, Chris and I are not guides. So right. don't so don't email us and ask if we can if you can book a trip to us. We're just we're just fly fishers like most of you. There may be some guides on there tonight, and we hold you guys in, in high esteem because if anybody know that knows the rivers and creeks, it's you because uh, you make a living uh, taking people fishing. We don't. We're just we just go out and find these as best we can. And um, and enjoy them. So um, hats off to all the outfitters out there. Okay, let's talk about Stack Rock in general here. What what you're looking at is the North Carolina trout map that's on the DNR website, and what you're looking at at the top up here is is Stack Rock Creek and Andrews Creek that I've circled, which is the which is just a a, a whoop go back up there. It's just a tributary of Wilson Creek running through the middle. All of this red water is catch and release artificial flies and lures only. The blue is, is wild trout water. Um, down in the bottom down here, this, these little black areas, this is a delayed harvest area. Now, this is not going to be in the area we're talking about tonight, but it's in the general watershed that we're going to be talking about. And so we show this for one reason, just to make sure you know the regulations, because I've had some people question me on, on Andrews Creek. They just closed. You can't fish it. That's not true. It is, it is, it is uh, catch and release. But there's a lot of water to be fished here. This is Grandfather Mountain. This is the south face of it. Gives you some indication of how much water to fish is just in that around a, uh, 10,000, roughly 10,000 acres that you're looking at right there. Chris, you want to talk about permits? Yeah, I mean, uh, you got 10 day passes, you got your annual passes uh, and lifetime. Um, there's resident and non-resident. Of course, we're non-resident, so we always have to pay a little more, which we're perfectly fine with because uh, North Carolina does a great job. Yeah. Uh, I, I think Georgia does good, but North Carolina does great. Um, and, uh, and so kids under 16, no license are required. Uh, and if you're a senior, then you get a price break. So yeah, uh, very important. I'm sure there's veterans discounts as well. So. There, there are. And, you know, when you compare with like Tennessee and the cost of permitting up there, uh, and licenses, yeah. I think North Carolina is a real, a real value, it's a, it when, is it, a value. when it comes to the amount of fly water you've got. Yeah. Um, Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about the overview of the area right here to give you a general idea. I'm going to, we're going to walk through this watershed with you and kind of show you the way it all fits together. 
running right through the middle of this central area here, you're looking at about roughly 10,000 acres, about 16 square miles under the Blue Ridge Parkway right here and Highway 221. And running right through the middle of that is, is, is Wilson Creek. That's the main watershed coming off the south side of Grandfather Mountain. This is Grandfather Mountain right here. Um, and this is the, the peak up here. Uh, as you come up, you got Linville and all these little towns over here. But this is the main flow coming off. Now, here the tri here's the tributary system. The one we're going to be fishing tonight is a little creek called Stack Rock Creek. Its main tributary is a little creek called Andrews Creek. It's coming off the side of it over here. And I'll give you a bigger, a bigger version of this later with a lot more detail. The next tributary going into, into Wilson Creek, which is also fishable, albeit smaller, is a creek called Little, little Wilson Creek. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a good little creek to, to chase fish on. You also have uh, Buck's Timber Creek, which I've, I've nearly been snake bit several times <laughs> on up there. A lot of timber rattlers that I've come across up in that area. Um, over on the side over here, just above Edgemont, you've got Laurel Creek, which is a nice little creek. The bottom of it goes into some private water. you got to be careful, but the headwaters of it is, is some really good fishing. And then over in the big open area on the left is the biggest watershed uh, or feeder creek going into Wilson Creek. It's called Lost Cove. And it's got actually some of the more remote creeks on it and, and really, uh, really good fishing in these tributaries right there. So wh what you've got here, you've got, you've got Grandfather Mountain, you've got Callaway Peak up here, which is about, uh, about 5,900 feet above sea level. I've actually been up on Grandfather Mountain in July when it was sleeting in the, in the middle of July. Um, it, it, on a night up there at the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games. Just a real, I'm going to show you some images of that later. Just a great place to hang out. You got Linville, uh, you got uh, uh, Newland and, and, and Beach Mountain and all these areas over here, then Boone and Blowing Rock. And so you kind of got, you kind of got this, this, this open area here with a lot of high, high ground and a lot of watersheds that you can spend the rest of your life fishing in. And I promise you, you still wouldn't be able yeah. to get to all of them, Never Chris. Yeah. Um, Grandfather Mountain, some of the some of the things around there, because if you go and you take your wife or husband and they're not fly fishermen and you got kids, it's like, what else can we do, dad or mom? Well, while I fish, y'all can go to Grandfather Mountain and go across the swinging bridge and see some incredible natural scenery up there. Also, one of the scenes in Forrest Gump was shot at Forrest Gump Curve, a very famous place. A lot of people take pictures there. Um, I always include this picture in the bottom left here because this is me with a wood fairy. And those of you who have read my book realize that wood fairies and wood nymphs can be a lot of trouble in a lot of different ways. And they are to be avoided at all costs. And this one was actually taken at the Karen on Grandfather Mountain. That's where I encountered her. So just be careful. They'll do. You can end up in trouble there. Another, probably the most salient, second salient landmark um, on Grandfather Mountain on the south face is the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, the scene that you're looking at on the right there. Is, is the Linco Viaduct, which was the last 1,600-foot uh, stretch of the Blue Ridge Parkway that was finished in 1987. Uh, they broke ground at Cumberland Gap up uh, on, between Virginia and North Carolina in, in, in 1935. So it was at 52 years later, I believe, is when they finally struck a deal with Hugh Morton and 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 got uh, where they could build this elevated road instead of blasting the side of the mountain out and it's an incredible place to see uh here's one one scene that you just saw and this can change literally in just a few minutes to where you'll be you'll be in the clouds uh now wilson creek runs just beyond that and just behind you is stack rock creek also, down 
Grandfather Mountain, down Wilson Creek, just below, about maybe about four miles, four or five miles below uh, Stack Rock Creek, Chris, there are two ghost towns down there. One's named Edgemont, one's named Mortimer. These were, these were um, highly populated areas with, with Ritter Lumber Company, had a massive sawmill there that was sawing about 35,000 board feet a day, a railroad. They had a couple of factories down there making hosiery for women. There was a CCC camp there that you see. And in um, 19, I think it was 1916, uh, there was a huge fire that they had clear cut the backside of Grandfather Mountain. A huge fire came and burned everything that was left. And then the, later that same year, I think in September, the remnants of a, of a tropical storm came up through there and drunk, dumped about four feet of water on the south side of Grandfather Mountain. And it totally wiped these two towns off the face of the earth. Well, they rebuilt them. Uh, built the factories back, CCC closed down, uh, the National Forest Service uh, bought a lot of the property, and then back in, in 1930, another flood came that was worse than the first one, and totally wiped, 1940 actually, uh, totally wiped it out again, and so this is really the only thing left, a couple of old stores, uh, foundations, a few houses that have been rebuilt, but at one time, even President Roosevelt visited Edgemont and stayed in the inn that was there. So it's kind of a famous place, a uh, cool place to hang out. Uh, as I said, if you look behind this sign, Chris, this is what the backside of Grandfather Mountain used to look like. Yeah. There was nothing there. It had been clear cut. And when it burned over and then it rained, all the dirt went down into the creeks and totally destroyed sure. The habitat. Yeah. Well, thanks to the United States National Forest Service uh, and, and what they've been able to do, you would not recognize the backside of Grandfather Mountain now because it looks second growth timber, but it is just a beautiful place to be. And they've done a great job of rehabilitating that. Uh, the last thing I will leave you with is that uh, the Brown Mountain, Brown Mountain is further down, uh, maybe about eight miles down from from Stack Rock Creek. And there, there are some lights that have been appearing there uh, over the last, well, even all the way back into the Native American years in the early 1800s, late 1700s, these lights would appear. And, but there's nothing there to create light. Uh, and so the, the, the Department of Interior, the USGS, all kind of PhD alphabet supers from the great schools of mines have been down there, Chris, trying to figure out what it is. They can't today figure out what the Brown Mountain lights are. And there are places on the parkway, as this sign indicates, that you can park and look uh, down and occasionally catch the lights. Now, keep in mind, this is where you are fishing, and when this doesn't mean a lot to you right now until you're camping out like I do by yourself, and you're in the middle of 100,000 acres, and you start thinking about these lights, and all of a sudden it gets real. Yeah. You know what? It does. So it, it got so popular at one time that the X-Files, the, 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 the series with, with Mulder and those guys looking for the aliens, they actually did, a, a, they did an episode about the Brown Mountain Lights and actually came into this watershed that we're going to be fishing today and shot an episode. Uh, and they, they, these campers disappeared. And according to Mulder, uh, the, the aliens got them and ate them or something. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting place to be. Now, the last area I'll show you that we'll talk about, this is just a, a sampling of some of the waters. Uh, at the, the, the one at the top here is Wilson Creek. As it as it comes under Edgemont Road, I'll show you that because we're going to go down that road. Uh, this is the, the, this one is is right below between Mortimer and Edgemont, and then this is below both of them as you as you get down in the gorge. And these these pools are deep and clear, and nothing nothing but but bedrock, like like being in a swimming pool down here. In fact, our our state biologist here in Georgia. A guy by the name of Monty Seahorn, a great American, a great biologist, great fisherman, and a great friend, 
um, grew up on the banks of this river, and he used to come down to the spot on the bottom left and actually spearfish bass mm -hmm. in there. Uh, so it's a, it's a great place to hang out and just beautiful water uh, to visit. All right. Now, Chris, here's th th this is Stack Rock Creek watershed as, as, as we're going to go over it. Now, I have dulled out Wilson Creek and Little Wilson Creek over here, and the only thing in blue is Stack Rock. Now, this is Grandfather Mountain. This is McRae Meadows over here where they have the Highland Games and the bagpipers and all that stuff going on. The yellow line here is Highway 221 running on the south face of Grandfather. The white line right above it is the Blue Ridge Parkway. And this intersection right here is where 221 comes off the Blue Ridge Parkway at about mile post 305.2. You can come off, get on that. 221, come down here to Edgemont Road and weave your way all the way down into this forest. And I'll show you this road in a minute. And it, it crosses, it crosses all of these creeks on its way down. And you can see the headwaters of these creeks all the way down. Now, another reason, Chris, is important to show this slide is because it shows the road system in this watershed. It shows Edgemont coming down. And then it shows Far Service Road, Far Service Road 192 right here is coming back and coming back across both Wilson Creek, Stack Rock, and Andrews Creek. So it's a great access creek for the lower stretches of the river and the mid stretches. And then the upper stretches, you can get on Edgemont right here. Now, we always say you better have a real map because you may not have cell phone service and 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 gps so always kind of have real maps to follow right it is it's always best i like uh there are two maps that i like other than a good gps i use a a garmin CSX x60 mm -hmm. with topo usa loaded on it but really my go-to map that i like best is either a usfs um or usgs topo quad of this particular area or a National Geographic map, which yeah. is a vector map that, that layers in everything from satellite imagery, topo quad, USGS, and then, and then highway maps. And we're not showing anything here that's not on a map. This is Google Earth you're looking at here, yeah. folks. So. Um, and you can drill right down to the stream level on this. I mean, I can drill right down to a culvert level and show you. All I've done on this is highlight the river flows, the water flows, where you can see those better. Now, let's say that we're, we're in a few minutes, we're going to go down and we're going to start at where the confluence of Stack Rock Creek and Wilson Creek come together right down here at this, at this X. And we're going to go all the way up to the headwaters in three different sections. And we're going to show you what that water looks like and kind of how we addressed it. Um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to pick up where Stack Rock Creek and Andrews Creek comes together. And we're going to track up Andrews Creek, which is which is a really good little trout stream also. Uh, actually, the flow is not much smaller than Stack Rock Creek, especially this time of the year when the water level is down. But this is a kind of the lay of the land. Um, if you're going to go and fish Andrews, then you're going to then you're going to want to come down here and you're you're going to want to get on 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 trail number 258A which is marked on Forest Service Road 192 and it's only 0.6 miles to get down to that confluence point right there and if you want to go if you want to go all the way down to the confluence of Wilson and Stack Rock it's another 0.9 miles so, but if you're going to come and fish up from the, uh, the confluence of Stack Rock and Wilson Creek, I recommend that you take Trail 258, which comes in or which starts on the left side of the road of 192, just after you pass Wilson Creek uh, culvert uh, as you come down. And that, that trail is eh, roughly about 1.4, 1.5 miles down. It's a little bit shorter than taking uh, 258A, but that's your call.
uh, it's a great walk any way you want to go it. So that's that's um, that's kind of generally what you know what these what the lay of the land looks like for these two creeks. Now we're going to start now down here at where Wilson and Stack Rock come together, and we're going to work our way up. Now, Chris, I see we got a couple of chats on here right now, but why yeah. don't we do this? Why don't we wait to the end? Yeah, let's. And we'll we'll I we're promise you we'll we'll cover all of the the chats uh, when we get to the end right here. Yeah. Uh, cause one reason I'm afraid is because if I click the wrong button, we may lose everything. All right, Stack Rock Creek, real sure. just kind of the highlights here, Chris. You know, we call this the at a glance in yeah. the book. I give it a four thumbs up out of yeah. a, out of five, which not necessarily because it's it's that great of a trout stream, because because of the size and number of fish in it, but it's just because of where you are and how beautiful it is, how remote it is, pristine it is. And you're not you're probably not going to see another person on there now i know a lot of people have said they've said to me um sam since you wrote this book we're worried that you know these streams are going to get covered up with people i wrote this book four almost four years ago and i fished stack rock creek probably six times you don't see since then i've not seen a single person on there now, trust so, me we, we're not we're not even given details that google does so um Google it, and, and you're going to find out a lot more than what we're going to share. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more on Google if you want the detail. Yeah. We do give the uh, the GPS fixes, but this thing comes off Grandfather Mountain at about 4,500 feet and goes down to about 2,300 feet um, where it goes into to Wilson Creek. You're going to lose about 2,200 feet over those 3.4 miles. The interesting thing, though, on average, you're going to, Chris, you're going to have a butt busting 12% gradient. It's tough. Most of that's at the top, but even at the bottom, there are places that you're you're going to be in a, you know, you're going to be in a in a 12 or 14, 15% grade there, and it can be, as we say in the effort right here, it can be moderate to dang near difficult in some places to get through, even though it's relatively open. You're going, to, you're going to be climbing over big rock gardens uh, where the stream disappears uh, and, and through little waterfalls and around waterfalls. Uh, there, there's a lot there. Fishing qualities, average, uh, rainbows, specks, and browns. Uh, when I was there uh, about three weeks ago, I caught more browns than anything else. Yeah. I did catch some specks in the upper waters of both of those, but um, I caught a lot of brown trout. Um, Access off the parkway, um, off uh, mile marker 3052, you get on, uh, exit onto Highway 221 East, you go to Edgemont Road in about a mile, and uh, which is Forest Service Road 1514, and you go down it about four miles to USFS uh, Forest Service Road 192, goes off to your right, and you're going to turn right and go a couple of miles and you're going to see um, you're going to see trail number uh, 258 first on your left that goes down to the Wilson Creek uh, Stack Rock Creek confluence you go about another mile and then you're going to you're going to see trail number uh, 258A which will go down to where um, Andrews and Stack Rock come together so good access these are good roads um, this is just an overview showing you what you know without lines what these watersheds look like there's there's the mouth of stack rock creek as it comes up it goes up to the source there's the source of andrews as it comes down of course here's wilson over here which is a much bigger creek coming down so that's kind of what it looks like again notice the road system coming down through here you have a really great roads that cut across here hard to get lost but I'd still encourage you, like Chris said, to, to, to have a map with you. Um, once you exit off of the parkway onto Highway 221 East, you're going to come to this fork. You're going to come to a fork in the road, and it was at Babe Ruth or whatever said, take it. Well, I'm telling you to take the one on the right, which is Edgemont Road. And you're going to get on Edgemont Road and head down it. Um, this is what Edgemont Road starts out looking like. It, it is a nice gravel well-maintained road you can look up and see the bridge and stack rock here you see the bridge actually going over stack rock creek 
stack rock is disappearing up Grandfather Mountain into the clouds. Now what we're going to do, we're going to go stand on the bridge and look back this way. And there's where we were, just where the last image was taken in that curve right there looking up. It's probably 100 feet to 120 feet off the, off, the, off, the, off the leeward side, the south side of this bridge, Chris. I mean, you will get dizzy looking off that bridge. And the creek down there, headwaters, maybe two, two and a half feet across, uh, not very big once you get up to that point. As you head down Edgemont Road, again, great road, a lot of great uh, interesting features here where the CCC and the Forest Service people blasted out these curves and left these areas that, you know, that, that are kind of interesting to look at. Um, you come on down, this is Wilson Creek, looking off of the bridge at Wilson, Wilson Creek. Uh, it could just as easily be named Stack Rock. Because stack rock doesn't look a whole lot different than this. Um, the question is, how did these rocks get stacked yeah. like this? Yeah, it goes back to uh, some of the flooding, right? It goes absolutely back to the yep. flooding that came through here. The water level was probably 20 feet over this, and it was taking 8- and 10-ton boulders and rolling them down the stream like bowling balls. And stacking them up and stacking them up and so you you get into these areas both on wilson creek and its sister creek uh, stack rock creek that literally the creek will almost disappear into these stacked i call them rock gardens and would disappear in some cases for 20 yards at a time you can hear it down there but you can't see it and then all of a sudden it'll pop out of the bottom of it like it's doing right here and take off in a stream form again but this is this is what would take time fishing a lot of these creeks on Grandfather Mountain is that nearly all of these creeks have these rock gardens and you have to negotiate yourself over these or around these and some of these can get pretty difficult to get around. Now as you come down and turn right on, on Forest Service Road 192 and go about a mile and a half, you're going to cross Wilson Creek. I think this is this either Wilson or Stack Rock. They both look the same to me right here. Um, I think this is, this is Wilson though. This looks like a Kwanzaa hut, just sitting out over the creek. And yeah. I told one guy one time this picture, I said, he said, what is that? I said, well, the Forest Service builds this for the trout to get in in the summer so they won't get hot, <laughs> so they won't get sunburned. Yeah. And the trout hang up in there, and you can go in there and catch them really easy. Yeah. He said, really? I said, no, not really. <laughs> the road is actually up here. This is actually one of the new design culverts that the Forest Service, the DNR, all these people are building, National National Park Service in order to let these fish migrate without being encumbered in a pipe or a drop or something like that. All of you who, all you Trout Unlimited guys and gals, I mean, you know what this is. You've seen this, had programs about it. A lot of the creeks and rivers in this part of the country have these types of culverts. And they really are good places to fish. I mean, I'm not just posing here like to take a picture. I mean, there's always some fish over here lined up on the side over here and, and above it coming in. Um, as you get to 258 Trail and start heading down to um, the confluence of Grandfather, uh, not Grandfather, but uh, Wilson Creek and, and Stack Rock, this is what the trail looks like for the most part. Uh, and I took this picture particularly because of the turkey toe that's, that's on the side here. It, it lined both sides of the trail for about a quarter of a mile. And you just felt like you were in a, you know, like Dorothy and Toto, you know, yeah. going through the, to the Emerald City. It was just one of the most beautiful scenes that I'd seen in a long, long time. And I thought it was worth putting in here. But this is, this is the trail going down to the confluence. And so that trail... That trail comes off the road right up here. It goes down along Wilson Creek and then parallels it down here closer and farther away down to this funny looking little little point right here. The way this thing kind of curves in, you got Wilson Creek kind of snaking in here. You got this ridge that's maybe 150 yards across long and then on the other side of it is stack rock creek it takes a, a sharp dog leg to the left and bang there's wilson right there you actually see the a drop pool right there uh and this this is earth sat satellite uh from google 
that we drilled down on. But anyway, the, the reason we wanted you to see this is that it graphically shows the confluence of these two of these two creeks. And it also shows the topography, which is not enhanced. This is a gorgy area right here with walls up to, you know, like 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 40, 45 degrees and portions of this coming down here. Very exotic place to fish. And I know a lot of people, you know, one of the arguments about writing or talking about these creeks is that, well, if you do it, everybody's going to go. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. They are not going to have hike a half a mile and a half down into this gorge, work their butt off to catch six inch fish. They're right. just not. Right. Uh, and, I, and I think a lot of the research supports that. Sam, what do we say about rain and thunderstorms, especially on this type of topography? If you're fishing, and I can tell you this from experience, on Wilson Creek, the next watershed over, but it looks just like this. If you hear rumbling and thunder and flashes of lighten, lightning and the top of the cloud is, is covered up in clouds like Mount Ar Ararat, yeah. you know, in the Bible, <laughs> hey, I don't think it's God up there getting ready to rain wrath down on you, but it's probably a thunderstorm. And you better pay attention of what's happening upstream. And if you see birds flying, if you if you get a, a a rushing sound coming and echoing or down the creek down here that doesn't sound quite right, uh, if you if the hair on the back of your neck stands up, you better run like hell yeah. because it's I coming. did I didn't and I barely got out of the water in yeah. time before a, a four foot wall of water came down yeah. and 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 would have taken me down to to, to probably the James River. Uh, on it on the bottom down here but that's a good question chris this area is very prone to flash flooding it has historically and i'm sure it will again take a friend yeah take always take a friend with you let people know where you are this, yeah. this is the last time i was there um this this little rainbow up here first fish i caught in this pool right here is probably the biggest fish i've ever caught in stack rock uh, this fish was about a 13 inch little rainbow pretty little fish um, and I thought, that, you know, if the day is going to be like this the rest of the day, it's going to be a great day. But anyway, this is what the water looks a lot like. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of rock gardens, um, a lot of nice runs and pools, runs down into these big pools uh, like this one right here. A lot of gravel, um, uh, not a lot of silt down in that area. So it's, it's a pretty healthy, it's a pretty healthy watershed down there. Uh, you won't see tires, you won't see Coke cans, you won't see the typical stuff that you see in a lot of streams that are that are closer around. Um, probably the first four fish I caught that day were, were, were brown trout uh, after that rainbow. Another run, this is the whole creek coming down through this one little one little stone chute right in into a big pool down here that was probably six feet deep. Even though the creek is not that big, it was a huge pool down there. Um, it's an, another rock garden right here. Um, it looked like I'm fishing. It does. Is that what it's supposed to look like? No. Well, I was. Yeah. Um, another image, a little bit further up, uh, not unlike, but what? But the reason we wanted to show you this image is that as 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 steep and rugged as this country can get, you'll come into this areas like this on the bottom left. That's just wide open. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you can walk up in the forest. There's no dog hobble. There's no vines. There's no nothing. There's just, you know, big trees up there. The rhododendron are not choking you out in the laurel. It's just a beautiful, a beautiful place to hang out. And then you'll go right back into a place that's just as so tight. All you can do is slingshot shot mm -hmm. or cast yeah. through most of it. Another little brown trout uh, right there. Pretty, pretty little trout. We've been into the browns lately. I don't know. I, We've been browns, a lot of browns. Caught browns in North Georgia up on yeah. the Tacoa River this weekend. Yeah. Now, if you get up to where we, we parked, and we would have parked right. This is one. This is this is the Forest Service Road 192 going along here. This is the Parkway. This is 221, and this is Edgemont Road coming down. We came down, and then we switched back and came and parked right here. You can actually see that trail going down right there. Um, this is what we kind of call the mid run. 
which is above the road, 192, where it goes under the cover, a big cover, and it starts going up through this relatively flat area right here before it jumps into the gorge again. Now you can see this, this forest service, fire service road right here. I've never seen this road not gated, Chris. If you, want to, if you want to hike up into this wild area right here and you don't want to walk the stream that far, just get on this old far service road right here, and it's about 1.2 miles to it crosses the creek right there. Uphill. We're, yeah, but it's not bad uphill unless it's you. Yeah, your, your bad uphill is worse than my uphill. So. This is not a bad uphill. I mean, <laughs> the trucks have to get up it, right? It's, uh, fire trucks have to get up it. But anyway, you can walk up there and get on the creek and then fish all the way up this exotic water to Edgemont Road right here. And then you can hitchhike back down to your car or have somebody come pick you up or whatever. But th this area is rarely fished just because it's so remote. Most people are not going to come off this ridge and come down here and fish up. Um, if, if I recommend taking, taking this, this fire road over to Midway, skip this flat area right here, put in right here and fish. You're not, you're not going to catch a bunch of big fish. Now this was caught right above the culvert um, on, on 192, a nice little fish. Uh, see these, these, these drop, the, these little falls into the drop pools right here, really good places to fish all the way up. Uh, here, I'm, I'm going to show you one of the pools here and then a fish that I caught, you know, in this pool, just to give you some general idea of what this looks like. Now this is a beautiful mountain pool. I think I can sneak up on a trout there. And you know what? We did. And no. there he is right there. This little rainbow, just a pretty little rainbow right, right, right over there. Um, this is a little further upstream right here when the stream flattens out a lot. Uh, it starts going up in that flat area that I said hike around. Which takes you up to the headwaters here, up to the bridge on the Blue Ridge Parkway right here. Again, this is Edgemont Road, Access Road coming down this, 221. This is the Blue Ridge Parkway Bridge, about 100, probably 120, 30 feet down to the bottom right there. This is a, this is a difficult area to fish, and you're not going to catch big fish. Um, I, I've caught uh, brook trout, and I've caught some rainbows up there. Uh, but this is generally what that part of the creek is going to look like. You get into the clouds a lot up there, even in the middle of summer, in the middle of the day, sometimes you look up ahead of you and fog will start coming down off of grandfather on you and will just flow down over you like a, like a river. Uh, the creek starts really tightening up right here. All you're going to be doing is some, is some roll casting, uh, maybe some slingshots. Occasionally you'll get an open area where you can do a, 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 a short cast, but you're not going to be casting over eight or 10 feet at a time right here. Uh, a bad picture of a pretty little fish. Uh, that's actually another one right there. Pretty little, little, little brook trout. Uh, this shows the creek coming down in a run right here in a, um, in a crevice in the rock. This is the entire creek coming down into this little drop pool right here. Um, and those are the kind of places you want to sneak up on and fish. Uh, stay low, stay below a 30 degree azimuth, slingshot it in there, roll cast it in there, stay as low as you can, um, don't disturb the surface. And more than likely, I guarantee you if there's a fish in there, they'll hit whatever bug you throw because they're just hungry as hell. Uh, but this is very typical of what you, it'll look like. The only reason this is open is because the flooding has scourged it out, taking all this topsoil off these rocks in this open area, and nothing can grow there. But you get right there, and it's about six feet across. Now, let's talk about Andrews Creek. Uh, as, it, as it 
comes together, Chris, with Stack Rock about 0.6 miles down the trail. Uh, you're going to you're going to come down here and, and 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 get on that trail. If I can get my my, my cursor going there, let me go back here. Hold on a minute. I want you to see. Well, my cursor froze. But anyway, uh, you got a general idea. This we we've, we've seen this slide before, but you should know where you are. We're going to go down to that point, and um, this is a this is a steep creek. Also, although it's not as steep as Stack Rock, it's about eleven percent grade. You if you fish from from the mouth to the source of it, you're going to lose. You're going to gain about fifteen hundred feet over two and two point six miles roughly. I do give it a four thumbs up just because it's a fun place to fish. Uh, very small. It is not a big creek. Although where it comes together with Stack Rock Creek, and you'd probably agree, Chris, these creeks are basically the same size. Yeah. Now, and we'll show them how they come together, but they're, they're basically the same size creek. Um, average, average fishing, uh, rainbows, specks, and browns, same way of getting in there. A uh, great place to fish. Uh, here, here's the here's the lay of the land. Uh, here here's the, the confluence of Stack Rock and Andrews. There's there's the source of Andrews coming down this gorge right here, and of course Stack Rock's coming up and then going over to the bridge over here. But that that's generally what it looks. We're gonna we're gonna start right here and work our way up Andrews, uh, off and go under the uh, Forest Service Road 192 access road right here, a really great road. Now this is another video, I'll show this video that shows these two creeks coming together, Stack Rock and Andrews, and as you'll see, they are not big, but they fish well. Okay, what we've got here is the confluence of Andrews Creek and Stack Rock Creek. And there's the pool they're both flowing into right here. Just a beautiful mountain pool. I think I'm going to have to jump in there. And then you can see the two creeks coming together. Andrew's over on the left. Stack Rock on the right. It's running right here in front of me. And then right at that point right there is where they two come together. And then from there on, it's Stack Rock all the way down to Wilson Creek. Of course, what you have are these beautiful pools all the way down full of fish. So... That's what I'm going to be doing. We're going to go after and we're going to catch some of those trout. All right. Well, as we start up from that confluence, uh, this is generally, you know, what that watershed looks like down there. A lot of rock, um, a lot of areas you're going to be climbing up and over, uh, but, but not that steep on the bottom area there. A few rainbows down in there these are not big fish these are six seven inch yeah. fish uh but what what impresses me i mean look at look at the size of that humpy right there uh, that's as big as his mouth is and and they'll hit it uh you know they'll hit a, a size 12 if you throw it in or they'll yeah. try to eat it they'll try so you know it's a it's, it's it, these fish are hungry uh be careful with them always make sure you take care of them use barbless hooks uh, wet your hands, yeah. release them. Uh, this time of the year, as it starts really warming up like it is right now, probably best to lay off of them, uh, let the water cool off. Although this water comes off over 5,000 feet, it's it, pretty chilly. It, it stays in the in the low 60s most of the year. It yeah. may get low in water, but the water's pretty cool. Yeah. But it will be, and I'll stress this, it would be what my, my great friend Pat Patilla used to say in, in, in our Trout Unlimited meetings. If the water was really clear, he would say, Sam, it was gin clear. That's pretty clear. It's clear. That's clearer than water. It's clear. Um, and the, this water most of the year around is gin clear, which means these fish, these are wild fish. They can see you coming for a while unless you stay low and you're pretty darn stealthy. And even with that said, there are times that you'll throw a bug in a in a drop pool, and you'll miss that you'll miss that fish. You want to have a little bit longer leader, yeah, and, and a little bit more tippet, right? Yep. Um, to to try to you know be as elusive as you possibly can. 
you, you, you really do. You want to get as far, far away as you can. Yeah. Uh, but what impresses me, Chris, about these wild fish and, and, and how hungry they are most of the time, there have been times I've missed a fish three times. That shows you how bad a, a fly fisherman I am. I throw it the drop pool. He bangs the crap out of it. I miss him. I throw the same bug right back to the same spot. He bangs it again, and I miss him. Okay? I wait. You know, I do the right thing. I wait 30 seconds. <laughs> I roll it up there this time. Bang! He hits it again, and I right. miss him. Right. And after I say a few man special management words, <laughs> I throw it one last time up there, and he, I'll be darned if, if he doesn't hit it again. Yeah. Now, I'm convinced in a drop pool that's no bigger than this desktop we're sitting at right here, there's not five or six trout in there. Yeah, there's not. Especially if it's a brown trout. He's the only one there, more one. than likely. Yeah. And even if it's a rainbow, there's probably no more than two rainbows in there. And and But the point I'm making, you, you'll be surprised sometimes how elusive these fish can be, and you'll get lucky to get one strike, and then you'll go back a week later, same hole, and I'll be darned, they'll hit it four times. Yeah. I, I can't figure that out. Um, this is the mid run on Andrews right here. This shows that forest road, that fire service road uh, coming in right, right over here. That you could come in and hike over if you want to, or you can fish all the way up Andrews from where it goes under uh, forest service road 192 right here. This is a pretty gorgy area right here, this mid run. This, this is a bus butt fishing area right up here um, that 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 fish. You can see these beautiful runs where the creek just narrows down uh, a couple of feet wide that comes out and spreads into a pool a heck of a lot bigger than you would think it would be. Uh, and then you wind up with a couple of little rainbows and browns in there. A lot of a lot of mossy areas here where the where the rocks are just beautiful green. It looks like you're somewhere in in Ireland or something yeah. like that. Uh, as you get up in Andrews, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, this area up here, I have only fished below Edgemont Road down here, below the culvert, down about 100 yards. Uh, I have not fished above uh, between there and the Blue Ridge Parkway where the creek actually, actually some of the water literally comes out right, right from that area. But I think the source, according to USGS, is actually right there at Edgemont Road. But but you can see Stack Rock over here and the bridge, and you can see Andrews right here, it just you know a quarter mile away. Um, as you get up to the bridge, this is what it, this is what the bridge looks like, and here's the creek flow. Here's what the creek's looking like approaching up under the bridge, about a hundred yards downstream this is where i started fishing actually in that pool right there and then started up and it I, I i stopped right under the bridge right here there's a great trail system under the bridge too if you don't want to go fish go walk the trail it yeah. will impress you yeah. it is an amazing place to work this is such a a harsh environment up here the trees uh twist through because of the, the, the uh, through the through evolution they've learned to twist themselves and spiral to become stronger uh so there's no telling how old this old tree is but you'll see a lot of this along the river and along the ridges up here but this bridge is an engineering feat and as you're standing underneath it looking up it's, it's pretty it's pretty awe-inspiring yeah. yeah. to be there now chris Mr. Bug, yeah. uh, USA, walk through uh, our guests the type of bugs that we like fishing with on this creek. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we, we're big on dry dropper on these creeks. I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's probably what you're going to be fishing. Yep. Um, but uh, I tell you, don't don't look past pertagons, um, and um, I, I think you'll find that you're gonna you're gonna uh, do pretty well with those. That's a that's a lancer, uh, uh, which is a great bug. That you're not typically going to see, um, and then uh, you have uh, a pertagon like a blue wing olive imitation here and here. Um, we've gotten into where we really like purple with a silver bead uh, tends to perform very well. Okay. Well, you know, purple is is a long wavelength. It is, and, yeah. and fish can see it in deeper water. Yep, they can see it further distances. Yeah, 
and there's some there seems to be some research that says even the younger fish have a have a longer sensitivity of weight of that wavelength yeah. than the older fish. yeah um it, the the other thing is soft tackles guys if you don't have soft tackles anytime you see sippers uh you you know you see fish just kind of coming up and sipping um you know definitely have some soft tackles beaded and non-beaded um here you see a stinger this is a excellent uh, uh searching pattern uh that performs very well for us in all types of water yeah you know especially on these wild streams that orange again is another wavelength uh color uh that, that that the trout key in on they, they i tell you they love those stingers they do it's a buggy looking bug it's buggy um sulfurs uh, we always like to have sulfurs with us uh this particular bug is very prolific for us um great little bug to have in a jig or a nymph style hook uh and then of course any type of frenchy uh to represent that pheasant tail uh, those mayflies yeah. uh, that's what you're really going after uh bwos you know and, and this <laughs> In our part of the world, a, a BWO, uh, if you don't have BWOs in your box, then you're, you're missing out. Right. Um, the great bugs. We were on the Tacoa this week. I think you were fishing BWOs. I was fishing you know? BWOs. So when you see a, a little bit of rain, uh, moisture in the air, uh, it looks like it's going to rain. You Dark, see those darkens up a little bit. Yeah, you see those little gray bugs bouncing on the water. That's going to be kind of a BWO imitation that you want to start changing bugs up and uh and and shift over to some type of pattern that looks like this okay and then obviously a multitude of 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 dry uh patterns um sam you're a big elk caracatus yes, sir. I, I, you know that's about what you <laughs> fish i'm a mac daddy uh, this is a big t mac daddy um i added a couple little items to it uh like uh like the uh, new zealand strike indicator uh but but this is uh probably one of the most prolific buzz this is a 14 that's about all we do these in is 14. Uh, and uh, obviously you can go to our website, these are available, but that that, uh, that Mac Daddy, you're gonna be able to see it. You're gonna be able to float some pretty heavy weight under it if you need to. Now in these streams, you're not gonna need to, to float you know, heavy bugs. No, but, but what you do need, Chris, with all the drop pools and all the foam and all the falls and runs and riffles in these small streams, that, that Mac Daddy, whoop, I'm telling you, you you can drop a monkey wrench from underneath that, yeah. and it. I've never seen a bug pop back to the surface yeah. the way that Mac Daddy does. It'll get so you it, through it, the riffles. Well, it does, but the thing yeah. is, I, you know, I use it more as a strike indicator just to feel good because I got another bug with a hook up there. Yep. But I use it as a strike indicator more than anything else. But yeah. lo and behold. So, quite often a fish will come up and just knock They'll the crap out of it and you and you got the mac daddy that, it, we it, it will tear the fish up yeah doesn't matter what the watershed is you know we, we like black patterns uh the brook trout love uh this polywing midge yeah um, <laughs> uh, it is a great bug uh brook trout just tear it up uh brown trout tear it up rainbows not so much uh, but it is a great little bug to have in your in your portfolio there. Uh, and then, of course, a black elk hair caddis, you know, 16s, 18s, uh, 20s, uh, great sizes to have. OK, and then we have some other dries that we like. Let me tell you something. This is a bug, this crackleback yeah. that you are not going to see anywhere. You're probably not going to see it in a fly shop. Um, you know, we have them in orange, purple, yellow, green, red. Uh, and uh, great little bug, especially like a size 18, uh, size 20. Oh my gosh. It's a buggy looking bug. It's buggy. It floats well and the fish just love it. And then of course you have your staples, atoms and some Royals, uh, some stimulators, um, you know, uh, stimulator, good bug, maybe a little too big uh, and bushy uh, for this type of stream, but still always good to have because you can see it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then some great fall winter patterns. Uh, you got you got a little inchworm. Uh, uh, that's a, a Kevin Howe uh, pattern. Case caddis. Uh, we always like to have a shaggy hair's ear. Yeah. Uh, a soft tackle. So a staple go to. It is, yeah. and and some stone flies uh, patterns, etc. So uh, you know what do we typically have? Well, we usually have six X yeah. um, on these gin clear, as you said, streams you're probably going to need to have 7x 
Um, I, I, I would not be fishing uh, with, with anything bigger than that from a dropper standpoint. Well, you don't, you don't need it. You don't need it. The fish are small. Um, and, and you're not going to break off, right. you know, unless right. you, unless you, you know, set the hook up into the trees. And sometimes we do that. We do that quite often. We get yeah. so excited. Uh, but, you know, 7X is great. Uh, if you're in a trout hunter, the halves are fantastic. Uh, we, we love those half sizes. Uh, I'm a Hannock guy, uh, but I do have some trout hunter with me most of the time. Um, and then, um, you know, for the most part, uh, size 20 bugs um and and even smaller you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do okay you know you're gonna do okay so that's a little bit about bugs uh we can talk about those later if you have questions on them um, what do we fish well like i said when we started the program we're kind of bamboo guys um but, I, we, but we have both oh i have both we, we've I, we, got the sages and all the stuff we don't that everybody else has got too but yeah. we just like bamboo yeah we like bamboo uh you know i got a six foot eleven uh, bamboo rod that, you know, uh, Granger taper that I use on these small creeks. Um, they're a lot of fun to fish with, uh, and they get you around those trees and everything. Yeah. What do you fish with? Well, my, my go-to is, is a seven and a half foot F.E. Thomas uh, four weight. Um, and you know, I just built that a uh, six foot two weight. Yeah. Uh, that I, that I had a, 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 a graphite six foot two weight that I fished for many, many years. And I wanted yeah. a bamboo. So, I've got a six foot two weight bamboo three piece now. That's a Granger taper, and um, it you know it's like it's it's, it's a slick rod. It's slick, yeah. It's slick. really really nice. But you know, nymphing. You know, these are great streams to nymph. I mean, you you, you can nymph these easier than you can fly fish them the way we do. I think. Yeah. You know, just reaching out there and dabbing those yeah. bugs behind rocks and uh, take care of rod. And, uh, ten, all. Ten, uh, ten care of all of that. All of that works yeah. well. Fantastic. So, so knock yourself out. I mean, it's it's good for for all of those. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, where where are we going to stay and where are we going to eat? I mean, <laughs> well, the most important pieces of this. This is the most important thing to me. At my, my age in life, these are the most important things. Like, where am I going to stay? Well, if I, we're not camping. Um, you know, we'll stay at Valley Cruces at the Valley Cruces Conference Center mm -hmm. or Linville, the Pixie Hotel, or one of my favorites, which is the Panola Inn, which also has campgrounds behind it. If you if you want to if you want to camp with with bathrooms and showers, so you can do either one there. Um, but if you want a pure camp and you're just going to go camp, uh, Fosco uh, in Fosco, which is over on the, the Watauga River on the north side of Grandfather Mountain, is Grandfather Mountain Campgrounds. And and the, the, really the, nice. the, the river runs right th through the side of it. Yeah. So you can camp and fish right there on, on, the, on the Watauga River. Uh, in Panola, at the Panola Inn Campgrounds, which is which was I just just mentioned that. And then almost anywhere in the National Forest Service on Grandfather Mountain, you can camp. And there are there are already tons of campsites there that are primitive camping that have been become perennial campsites for many, many people. So if you want a primitive camp, you can camp right there on the creeks or right there on the road and and have good access and everything. If you know if, if you're not going to cook your own food, Time Castle on the north side of Grandfather, you got Bella's. And you've also got the Highlander Grill, and you got the Peddling Pig. But well, what's famous about the Peddling Pig, Chris? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, you don't remember. Well, it just so happens for those of you, you who, talk a lot, you know. For those, some of, stuff just goes right I, through. I, I, I talk. I know way too much about stuff you that do. really don't matter. But this is important. You need to know this. If you're if you've ever fished the Watauga River, either up in Tennessee around Elizabethton or you know, Wilbur Dam or any of those big watersheds up there. But if you've ever fished the Watauga River coming off the north side of Grandfather Mountain, it actually does not come off of Grandfather Mountain. It comes out of a little pond sitting behind the Pedal and Pig Barbecue Place. It's actually a culvert. Well, it, right. come, it comes it comes under the road yeah. under a culvert, but it actually yeah. flows in a culvert under the pedal yeah. and pig. Uh, so anyway, just to, now I, mean, I do remember that. And this, is, <laughs> and this is also the same place. You can stand in the middle of the road in Tynecastle, 
and you can throw a rock as hard as you can to the right, and you'll throw it into the Watauga watershed or headwaters. If you throw it to the left, you're going to throw it into the Linville River watershed. Now, the interesting thing there is very few places anywhere I know that two major watersheds source that close together where one, which in this case, the Watauga, flows and goes north and goes into the Gulf of Mexico, mm. and the, 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 the other river flows south and goes into the Atlantic Ocean. Really? Yeah. The Linville River goes into the Atlantic, and the Watauga goes into the Gulf of Mexico, and they source up across the street from each other. Crazy. So that's worthy of sitting there at the Highlander Grill, drinking a beer and yep. thinking about. Yep. Okay, and then also uh, Banner Elk, you got a great place to eat there, the Lodge and Panola uh, Pizza Inn. Uh, you got some really good places to eat and stay there. So, you know, there, there's no excuse not to go. Local Outfitters, uh, these are three uh, that we think a lot of. You got Boone, uh, Boone Fly Shop in Boone, right downtown, sitting right in the middle of all the good breweries. So you go buy flies and drink a beer. Yep. You know, uh, Fosco is sitting in Fosco there uh, on the main road, sitting on the Watauga River or right in front of the Watauga River. So uh, the great, great guys um, owned by the same folks, I do believe. And then in Hickory, you got Dave down at, I know that's a little further away, but Dave in Castor's Fly Shop is a good friend of ours. And um, you say, well, Sam, there's a lot of other uh, fly shops around there. Well, there are, but they don't sell my book, so I don't put them on the slide. <laughs> That's all I can say to that. Now, one last thing before we get into the chat and answer questions that any of you might have, please, uh, if you do like what you see, uh, like, follow, subscribe to us. We are archiving all of our programs on Wild Bearings Outdoor TV Network uh, on YouTube as well as this series that you're watching, the 18 or 20 that we've already done are archived on there of all kinds of other river streams and creeks. Uh, visit our Mojo friends, 10% uh, discount. All right, folks, we've enjoyed being with you tonight. Um, hope you visit these and other watersheds in that area, and uh, hope that we see you on a stream sometime and uh, do some fishing together. Have a great evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.